Amen. What I'm going to ask you to do this morning, in honor of uh, Sister Linda, is if maybe God's laid something on your heart and you want to stand and testify this morning. If Linda were here, she would be the first one up. And like I said, one of the last conversations I had with her was that she is hoping and praying every day to be able to get back on her feet, to come back into church, and to give her testimony and to tell how good God's been to her. If anybody had a reason to complain about life, it was Linda Toomey. She'd been sick since practically the first time we ever met her. She died, nearly died, in her house. God brought her back to life. The man that God used, her husband, to keep her alive waiting for the ambulance there, he went on to be with Jesus, and then she lost her mom, and then she lost the battle herself. And um, so this morning, if God's touched you in some way and you'd just like to stand, would you do that? Anybody but Gary. Anybody else except... No, go ahead, Gary. Amen. 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 We were talking first time we were in my office, and you pray for Gary. He's got some health things going on. He doesn't really want everybody to know about it right now until they find out more. But we were talking. I said the first thing I really learned about Kenya was that I noticed in their churches they put a lot of emphasis on healing, laying hands on and healing people. And I got to thinking about that. You know, here in America... Well, if you put emphasis on healing, you're one of these faith healers and you're, you're all about, about big money and putting on a big show and it, we know a lot of that's fake. But over there, they don't have doctors for everybody. You can't get into a hospital unless you have the money in hand before you go to the hospital. They won't let you in. They'll let you die on the doorstep. And... Um, so it just that was one of the first things that I picked on, up on out there was since they didn't have human physicians, they relied heavily on the great physician. And that was a blessing to me. So somebody else. Yes, Sister Betty. Yep. Amen. From what she told me, do you know why they started coming over here? The church they were going to, they said it had gotten so far away from the gospel, the truth, what churches was supposed to be like. They said they just couldn't take it anymore. And God, they just found this place and came in and just fell in love with it. And um, they appreciated the fact that we were still a church and not an entertainment bar. So I always appreciated that about her. Anybody else? Go ahead. Amen, Brian. We love you. Love you and your family. They've been through a lot too. God's blessed them and you continue to pray for them. John.
picture of what was going to happen. Uh, Gary's death, in some ways, to be honest with you. But he blessed me so much with Miss Linda and, and all of those, for that matter. Um, well, I'm a minister, and I said this at the funeral. I'm, I'm the one that's getting ministered to. Okay? Because God is showing me how to love and go up as much of that love at all. And uh, Jesus, I want to know the love that Jesus has, at least in some way, that he's blessed me with. Amen. Anybody else? Go ahead, Sister Pam. these things are everything that Linda would have said. She loved her church. She loved you people. We loved her back. She loved her family. She loved Jesus Christ. She loved the Word of God. Anybody else? I'm trying to stretch this out for a reason. Turn to Ephesians 6 and when you turn there, I'm going to admit something to you. And, and I haven't felt this way in a long time. But I do not feel like preaching today. Maybe it has something to do with what, I'm, what I've got preached here, what I've got in my notes. I do not know. But I am really just struggling today. And there's no... I can't think of a reason for it. I've not been out in some big sin. I've been studying more now than I have been lately. Um, but I guess it's just the devil's fighting me today and I don't want to preach. I just soon sit down and somebody else come rolling in here and say, Hey, God told me to come here and preach. Hey, it's your, it's your pulpit. So you pray for me this morning and you long suffer with me. Okay? And um, if all I do is just read these scriptures to you this morning, that should be enough. 
But you pray that the Lord will help me this morning with whatever it is that's going on. And you pray for your pastor this morning. I've always been, at least tried to be honest with my church on, on days that physically I'm not feeling well. Maybe emotionally I'm not feeling well. Maybe that's it. I don't know. But at least for you to know that I'm not any different than anybody else here. There's days you get up on Sunday and you just don't want to come. And you know it's a fight. And sometimes you don't. You don't come. And uh, I know what that's like. But I guess they won't pay me if I don't show up. So I guess I got to show up. So you pray for me this morning. Pray that God will enable me to at least say something that will be a blessing to somebody somewhere today. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And I, maybe that's what I'm dealing with today. Wily coyote devil. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. When you don't feel like serving God. Serve God. When you don't feel like praying, pray. When you don't feel like reading your Bible. How many of you ever had to deal with that? You better raise that hand. When you don't feel like preaching, preach. Because those are the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Again, I feel fine today. I think my mind's okay. But I'm not, I don't think I'm wrestling against flesh and blood today. I'm wrestling against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God. Now something that I am, if God allows me, and I can get this out. So I'm going to stress to you today the importance of taking the gospel with you every single day and not leaving it out. If I were to ask you this morning, if you would stand or raise your hand, and I'm not going to do that. If I were to ask each and every one of you this morning, stand up for us and recite for us the Romans road of salvation and the scriptures that you know you could use to lead someone to Jesus Christ. Would you be able to stand and do that in front of this church this morning? Now, I'm not asking you to do it. It's not a contest. I'm not putting on a show. Do you know how you're saved? Do you know why you're saved? Do you know enough of the Bible to show someone else how they can be saved and have eternal life. Do you know those verses? Even if, even if you just said, hang on, let me pull my phone out here. I don't have them all completely memorized, but I know where they are. Would you even be able to do that? Is what I'm asking you. Because you know somebody that's lost, don't you? You know somebody you work with. Somebody you go to school with. 
Somebody in your family. Somebody that lives in your house. Somebody that lives across the street, next door, down the road. Somebody on Facebook. You know people that are lost. One of the wiles of the devil is that he knows he can destroy anybody, number one, that is not themselves saved. And I'm going to kind of save that for the helmet of salvation. If you ever plan on beating the devil at anything, you cannot do it if you are lost. Can't be done. But I'm asking you this morning, I am challenging you this morning. Do you know how to lead someone in the scriptures? Because I'm going to ask you a question. Can they be saved without the scriptures? No. Nobody can. So if you don't have the scriptures to give them, how can you expect them to be saved? What is it God said? My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And I'm not saying you got to memorize the whole Bible, but my goodness, five or six verses of the Bible that you at least know where they are. And nowadays, everybody is carrying a Bible on their phone, or you should have one. And if you can't even think of five or six verses to show somebody how to be saved, then I guess the wiles of the devil won that day. Because principalities and powers, rulers of darkness of this world have kept at least you in darkness. And now, because of your, and forgive me when I say this, but because of your ignorance, and I mean that word. Because of your blatant ignorance of learning five or six verses out of the Bible to show someone else how to be saved, that person remains in darkness. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand. Stand therefore. I, I've had this thing in my mind Back years ago, I, I watched a little piece on television about how there, some guy, they interviewed some guy that knew how to get a hold of Ebola and different plagues and different um, chemical agents, that, that chemical weapons. This was back when we, everybody was talking about Saddam Hussein having chemical weapons. They interviewed this guy and he said he knew how to get a hold of them. He could buy them on the, on the black market. And he could go and he could release them anywhere. And I got to thinking to myself, what if, what if somebody released a chemical agent or some biological agent downtown St. Louis and they had it all cordoned off and wouldn't let anybody in because there's chemical agents there, biological agents, and everybody that was inside the cordoned off area, they were just doomed to die. What would I do? And I thought, you know what? I'd want to go in there. This is how I felt when I was younger. I would want to go in there since those people are dying and I'd like to give them one more chance to know Jesus Christ because they're going to die. I'm not so sure now that I'm older that I'd want to do that. I hope I would. But the evil day is coming. And there's too many people around us that are lost and they are all going to fall in that day. And you have chosen not to take with you this. 
Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with, and I want you to pay attention to these words, the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now ask the question, why did he say it that way? Why didn't he just say, have your feet shod with the gospel? Why did he say, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace? John, how many years ago did you get saved? Almost 10. Gary, how many years ago did you get saved? 25 years ago. Why didn't you just wait until the day you were going to die? Because you don't know that day. So you know what you did? You prepared yourself with the gospel. You prepared for a day that you knew was inevitable. You were going to die. At some point, we knew Sister Linda was going to die. But you know, she didn't wait to get saved until just a few days before she died. She got saved years ago. Why doesn't somebody just wait until the day they die? Because they don't know when they die. So that's why they prepare ahead of time. Because they don't know and they will never know. And God's not going to tell you. He hasn't told me. There is no expiration date on your birth certificate. You don't know when. So you must be prepared at all times with the gospel. Somebody say amen. amen. Father, I don't know what's wrong with me. You know, you know, God, I don't know. But I need your help today. So Father, would you help me? Or Father, in my weakness, just be strong. Just say things to somebody that only you can say. Maybe I'm not supposed to say a whole lot. Maybe I didn't, maybe I didn't prepare enough. I don't know, God. But Father, these people have come to me for bread. And I just do not have any bread. So I'm asking you, Father, for their sake. Would you rise and give them bread? Be a good neighbor to us. And rise and give us bread. Because we're on a long journey. None of us knows. Father, it could be that somebody out of this church this week could just depart into eternity just like that. Somebody watching online could die this week. We don't know. And so, Father, I pray, dear God, that you would prepare us with the gospel to know every day, every single day, to know beyond any shadow of a doubt that if we were to die that day, we would be saved. We would know we're going to heaven. And in contrast to religions, God, that they never know if they're ever saved. Father, that your people would know. So, Lord, I'm asking you to bless this message. Bless the preaching of your word. Lord, I love you and I trust you and I only trust you. And Father, these people today should only trust you. We ask your blessings now in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Thank you for that. Amen. Turn to Romans chapter 1 verse 16. Let me explain to you a little bit about what the gospel is. I want you to read along these verses with me. I'd like for you to underline them in your Bible because I believe they are important. First of all, when it comes to the gospel, the Apostle Paul said this, Romans chapter 1 verse 16, this is the first letter that we have of the Apostle Paul in our Bibles, and he said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Now, I just want to ask you a question, are you ashamed of the gospel of Christ? Are you ashamed to let people that you work with know that you're a Christian? 
Are you ashamed to let family members know that you're a Christian, uh, that you know the gospel? Are you ashamed that, are you ashamed to pray in public? Are you ashamed to carry a Bible around and be seen reading it in public? I was in a, I was in a, um, an airport waiting on, on a plane in Baltimore, Maryland, and this Jewish rabbi came in and sat down and he pulled his, pulled his Tanakh out, which is the Old Testament, and he just sat there in the middle of everybody just reading that Hebrew Bible. And I wanted so bad to be able to go over and talk to him. I didn't know the thing to say. I wouldn't know anything to say. If God had put it in my heart to say it, I would have went over there and said it. But he didn't, never did it. But I was just marveled at that man. He was not ashamed to know who, to, for anybody to know who he was. Muslims don't have a problem with wherever they are laying on a carpet out five times a day facing Mecca and falling down in prayer. In fact, they demand that everywhere they go now that they be allowed to pray five times a day. And yet most, most, most church people are afraid and ashamed to let people know that they are a Christian, that they are born again, that they are saved, that they have a religion, and that they practice their religion. Most people are ashamed and afraid to let other people know that. That is a shame. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. So think about what he just said. And, and back in Ephesians chapter 6, put on the whole armor of God. What is the, what is the preparation of the gospel of peace? Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It is the power of God. When he told us that on that evil day we would need to stand, what part of your body is it that you use to stand? The feet. Which is why you have to have the, your shoes, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. If you don't have the gospel of peace, you will not be able to stand in that evil day. You will fall. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. It does not matter if they are Jewish. It does not matter what if they already have a religion. You don't worry about that. You just try to approach them with the gospel. Now I know there's times when God. I believe there's a time and a place for everything. I don't believe that you ought to just go up to people. And embarrass them publicly in front of everybody. I'm not. I'm not uh, uh, the kind of. I'm not a street preacher number one. Number two, I would never be the kind of street preacher that would deliberately try to embarrass people publicly wherever they are by shouting them down, calling them names and everything like that. If I were to preach out in public, I've done it one time in Kenya. I, and I, in my heart was that I loved those people. I wanted them to know that I loved them. I wasn't trying to embarrass them, but I wanted them to know that they were going to die and go to hell and that they, they didn't have to. They could know and meet Jesus that day. It is the power of God into salvation to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In Galatians chapter 1 verse 11, Paul said, I certify to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. The gospel that we have is not a man-made religion. It is not a church-made religion. Churches don't determine whether people are saved or whether people are lost. Churches don't save people. Religion doesn't save people. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that saves people and no other thing in the world. If you invite people to church, I wish you would invite people to church. But I don't want you to think or them to think that just because they came to church, now they must be right with God and they're saved. They're not. If they do not have the gospel in their heart, if they do not believe, uh, turn to um, 1 Corinthians 15. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. If they refuse to believe this, they are not and will not be saved. 1 Corinthians 15. Here's what Paul said the gospel was. For I delivered unto you, this is verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to what? The scriptures. 
Now, so let me ask you this question. Again, can you lead somebody to Jesus without a Bible? No, it's impossible. And I got into it with a guy while I was preaching one time up in New York. He, I've mentioned a bunch of new age terms. And I said, these are all in the church. And he raised his hand. He said, well, I use terms like this all the time when I'm trying to reach people for Jesus. I don't give them all them Bible words. They don't understand that. I said, then they're not saved. You're not doing anything for that person. You're, you're just giving them a bunch of new age garbage. That means absolutely nothing as far as their eternal life is concerned. Why won't, why won't you give them the gospel? I had a man call me one time. He was a youth minister in his church. And he said they brought in a, they brought in a guy that was going to preach to all the young people in the church, one of these youth evangelists. Usually these guys are nothing but clowns. They like to be funny in front of everybody and tell jokes. Some of them, many of them, dirty jokes, off color jokes. I've been in services like that. But he said this man preached and preached and preached to all these teenagers there, had them all over the place, had a bunch of them down at the altar, but it, it occurred to this youth pastor, he never quoted scripture. One time, one time did he never do that. So he went up to the guy after the service, and he said, I don't mean to be mean to you, and he said, I don't mean to, you know, I'm not trying to, to just come at you or anything like that, but I noticed that while you were preaching, you never quoted scripture to these people one time. He said, well, most of these kids, they wouldn't understand that anyway. Years ago, Courtney, you might remember this. At least you might remember this. We went to, when, when we were going down to Niangua, Missouri for Bible camp, one of the top dogs, and I went to Bible college with this guy for a semester, so I knew him. One of the top dogs in the denomination. One of the big guys. He was a couple years older than me. He was the big youth man. And oh, he did all the youth revivals in the denomination. And everybody loved him. When they called him to come and, and preach for the, for the kids at youth camp, they told him, they said, now first thing we ask you to do, just to keep it simple for everybody, we ask you to use one Bible, and that is the King James. You know what he said? It made him mad. He said, I don't even think I own a King James. They said, well, that's what we're asking you to do is use the King James. So you know what he did? In rebellion, he went out and found the cheapest new King James Bible that he could find. And then, for an entire week, preached five sermons to those kids... And never quoted a verse one single time. That was the last year we went. Because I, I went to the board guys and I won't mention names. But I said, this ain't right. You know, one of the things he preached was that he grew up in Springfield, Missouri. And he knew that Brad Pitt... Went, grew up in Springfield, Missouri. And he mentioned to these kids now, we're talking about 14, 15, 16 years old, who just bleed hormones. They're just full of hormones, right? So he mentions to these kids that he played football against Brad Pitt. And, you know, Time Magazine voted him the sexiest man alive. So he said, I guess maybe at one time I touched the rear end of the sexiest man alive. And I'm just going, you're an idiot. I almost got, I almost grabbed my kids and got up and left. I don't know why I didn't. It is according to scriptures that the gospel is given. Paul said it is according, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. If you mean to lead somebody to Jesus Christ and you're not using the Bible, then you're not going to lead. You might lead them. Hey, we can get, our emotional services can get anybody to cry and cry at an altar. But does that save them? Romans 3.10, as it is what? There is none righteous, no, not one. Now, you might want to write these verses down somewhere. Because I'm going to give you the Romans road. 
as it is written. There is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.10. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And as you're reading this verse to that person, tell them, that means me too. And you know what you might do? If you're talking to somebody and let's say that you know they got a drug problem and you used to have a drug problem, you know, you could say to them, look, I used to have a drug problem too. You know, why would you, why would you say that to them? Huh? Because you're telling them, I am just like you. You know, I had three bad marriages. I'm the worst husband that's ever walked the face of the earth. But when God saved me, he changed me. You know, I used to drink like a fish. But when God saved me, it took a while. I admit it took a while. But God finally took that out of my life. You know, I, I used to have a stack of Playboys that high. So I know what it's like. And you could say to them, you know, even after I got saved, it was a real struggle. But over time, God just started taking that stuff out of my life. Don't go to them perfect. Because you're not. Show them that God's grace really does work to forgive people's sins. All of sin to come short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Write this one down. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. My favorite, my, my favorite example of this is right out of the Bible. And, you, and I'm telling you, the closer you stick to the Bible, the better off you're going to be. Because some people have in their mind, well, I, now I'm here, I am going to church, and I'm eating the little wafer they give you, and I got to bow 20 times during the service, and I know that priest, he's molesting boys, I'm not even going to be a part of that. Just say, no, it's not about that because there was a thief on the cross next to Jesus that was, he was pinned down to that cross just like Jesus was. And he didn't have the chance to be religious. He didn't have a chance to go to church. He didn't have a chance to give any money. But he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And, he, I, and you can tell them he qualified under that. He confessed that Jesus was Lord and he believed that he was going to have a kingdom even before he died. So he and Jesus said, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. So actually, I'm not trying to sell you on going to church anywhere or becoming religious. What I'm trying to tell you to do is that you're going to die and go to hell. And all God wants to do is forgive every sin that you've ever committed. And then you let God worry about what he does with you after that. Ephesians 2, 8. Through ten. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now you can tell, you take that to the Jehovah's Witness when they come to your doorstep. 
or the Mormons. You know why the, you know why the Jehovah's Witness and Mormons are at your doorstep? Because they were told that if they don't, they don't go to heaven. Because they're saved, they believe they're saved by works. You know what got you know what got through to Bradley Crumb? Do you know what got through to him? He was he was dating a girl that was not a Mormon at that time. And that Mormon church had come down hard on him and told him, you either get rid of that girl or we will excommunicate you. Because do you know what part of Mormon salvation is? You must marry another Mormon. You know what the divorce rate in Utah is higher than any state in the union. Do you know why? Because if you're a Mormon and your spouse decides they don't want to be a Mormon anymore and they leave the church, you divorce them and marry another Mormon or you can't go and be a god over your own planet. Divorce rate, and somebody look it up, divorce rate in Utah is, I mean, it's way up there. You tell that to them on, you know, and you know what got to Bradley? Bradley, I had been talking to, he reached out, it was Brady first. And then he started telling me about his twin brother, Bradley. And he put Bradley on the phone. I thought I might have been talking to Brady. I thought Brady might have been schizophrenic, you know, double, two people, you know, what is it they call that? Huh? Yeah, double personality, because they sounded the same. And then finally, I heard them talk at the same time on two different lines. I'm going, okay. <laughs> but what got Bradley was, he was upset that they were going to make him get rid of his girlfriend, which she left him anyway. So he come over here early on a Sunday morning before everybody else got here, and he's talking to me. And he said that he had to go to his bishop there and confess his sins. I did not know that. And I went, do what? He said, yeah, they make us confess our sins to, the, to our bishop. And the Holy Ghost right then said, Mike, say this. I looked him in the eye and I said, Bradley, I know for a fact you didn't tell him everything, did you? And he looked down on the floor and he said, no. I said, why? He said, because I'm afraid to. I said, let's see. Let us therefore go boldly unto the throne of grace. And he finished it, that we may find mercy and help in time of our need. And he got saved not too long after that. You are saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest as any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Read them this verses because you, you can tell them, look, when I first started going to church, I still had some sins in my life and it took a while for God to get rid of one and then God was patient and then after a while God took this out of my life and then after a while God took that out of my life but I decided that it would be better if God took it out of my life rather than me trying to take it out of my life because then all I was doing was faking my way and making everybody think I was better than I really was Let's stop making people think that we are self-righteous. Can we do that? And then John 3, 16. For God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Write that down. And then 1 John 1, 
Verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Write those verses down. The preparation of the gospel of peace. Because if you try or somebody you know. In fact, this will really work on somebody that you know that is trying to quit drinking. Or somebody that their wife threw them out. Or somebody's trying to quit some kind of sin and they're going to some psychological deal where they give them positive affirmations to say every day. This will work on somebody that you know that God is dealing with them about their sin. Because you can tell that they're not at peace at all. Because principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places are just destroying them. It's destroyed their family. It's destroyed their testimony. It's just, they've lost their job over it. Nobody likes to be around them anymore. I mean, it, it, everything, when everything starts piling up against somebody, that's the person that you can go to. And give them what, what we have total here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven verses. Give them seven verses. And then ask them. You know, in our church, you don't confess your sins to the priest because. Number one, he doesn't want to hear it. Number two, his is just as bad as yours. So what good would that do? In our church. You tell them directly to God. So ask them. Would you like to ask God right now. To forgive you of all of your sins. Would you like to do that? I was at a guy's house one night. I was talking to him and I, was, I laid this out for him. Romans wrote of salvation. And I asked him that question. I said, would you like to ask God to forgive you of your sins? You know what he told me? He said, I lay in my bed every night crying myself to sleep. Begging God to somehow forgive me to, for the things that I've done wrong. I said, well, God sent me over here to tell you that he's ready to do it now. You would be amazed at the number of people you find that really do want to be saved. But they're afraid they'll be hypocritical about it. They're afraid they won't make it. They're afraid of a lot that the devil throws in. You know how the devil does, don't you? He throws up everything in the world why they shouldn't be and they can't be and they won't do it. God knows, God knows every way around that and he knows how to save them. So I've given you seven verses to write down. Memorize them. And in case you go, I left my phone somewhere. Well, let me tell you what I know. And be prepared. Be prepared to give somebody the gospel of peace. So you can stand with those shoes on in that evil day. Because that evil day may come to somebody you know. And you'll be standing for them like the angel of the Lord with a sword in your hand going, Devil, you're not getting them today. I don't want to preach anymore, so let's pray.
The greatest thing that God's ever done for me is give me the gospel. The greatest thing that God's ever done for you was somebody showed you the gospel. Who showed, do you remember the day somebody shared the gospel with you? Why not somebody else? Why not somebody that deserves it? Even if they are, even if they do want to hit you. And if they are going to be mad at you. You could be the only thing between them and eternity in hell. So this morning, when we pray, I want you to ask God to send you somebody. That wants to hear the gospel. Do that. Ask God to send you somebody. So that it's easy for you to do it. And it will be. It will be the easiest thing you've ever done. But people. Too many people are rolling off into hell every day. And not enough people are being saved. Are you prepared to stand for them? Father, I love you. I love these people. I love the gospel. And I love, Father, the things that you've done in people's lives when you change their life with the gospel. I love that. I've... I've never done any I've never done anything greater in my life than when I showed somebody the gospel and they got saved. And I pray dear God, Lord, that whatever weakness is going on in me today that your strength would be in the words that have gone forth from this pulpit. God that you deal with somebody today. Maybe somebody Lord. Turned this video on. And watched it. And, and they're asking you right now to save them. God would you save them. Cause them to confess their sins to you. And save them and forgive them. And give them a new life to live. But father this church. And these people. I can say, God, that that's one thing, Lord, that I wish we did more of. Is pray for lost people. And show a love for lost people. And try to witness to lost people. And Father, would you do that? God, I don't even care if they go to church here. I just want them to be saved. I don't hate anybody in this world enough that I want them to spend eternity in hell. So Father, Lord, would you teach us, train us, and use us to pray for, work with, and witness to lost sheep. That they could be saved and know what we know and to have what we have. Bless your word in these people's hearts. Bless it in mine. Thank you, God, for preaching to us today. We love you. Dismiss us now in your care. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen.